Well, we're thankful again tonight. The Lord spared our lives. Give us another time of worship. Shared with us what it takes to keep us alive upon this earth. And offered us an opportunity tonight to study more of his will. We're thankful that the Lord sees to it that we are sustained by the things that are necessary for our existence. But we're also very thankful that the Lord has gone far beyond that. He could have made us like that he made the animals and that the spirit of man would be like the spirit of the animals and we would go downward. But we're thankful he didn't make it that, that way. But he's made us in his own image. He's breathed into our nostrils a breath of life. And he also made man a quickening spirit. And we're delighted in that. And that is the difference. And it shows a, a great difference, a major difference in, in that which God has intended and proposed for man. And that which he has intended and he has as a purpose of the animal kingdom. I want to continue tonight, just continue right along the study that we had last evening. Free will study actually carries with it several lessons that I gave down home concerning it. I don't know that we will get to some of the things that we do, but uh, I want to mention a few of the things. I went back and looked at the study of the free will and it seems there was no difference religiously as it was true of many subjects. When you go back and look at what the world styles and religionists style, the church fathers. Now, I don't, I don't call, call them church father as, as, as uh, uh, the different ones that we look at. And we might get a chance to read some of them and the historical points that they make. But they are actually some of the early historians that came on the scene during the days of the apostles. Some of them wrote a little bit then. And yet a, a number of them wrote uh, just after the apostles' death, just after John and his writings. Some of them wrote uh, in the year 100 or so. Some of them in the year 200 and so. Some of them in the year 300 and so. And they are actually the individuals that cover a time period from the end of the apostolic age when there probably were still miracles and there were <coughs> probably inspired men, but these men were not inspired. And so the word to me doesn't mean much more than words of people today in itself. Many of them lived in the corresponding times of the early church before the the great falling away before a lot of the apostasy came upon the church. And they had a grasp um, of some of the information, the good information from inspired men. They had recollection. But that doesn't mean that we can trust their words and, uh, and accept and choose their words in opposition to the will of God, not, not in the least. Uh, many individuals have made a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of clamor about the fact that we should listen to the church fathers and we should pay, pay very special and close attention to them as much so or more than maybe some of the apostles because the church fathers carried on the traditions, the traditions. And there's a lot of religions that give a lot of credence to traditions. In fact, they consider traditions to be equal to or superior in some cases to the Word of God. But in mentioning them, I mentioned them for this particular reason, much of what they wrote about the free will of man is in total harmony to the will of God. And in fact, they quote the scriptures that would teach such. And they promote the principles that identify such. And so if we get along that line or the, that far into that, we'll read some of them. If not, uh, that might be something that you could consider looking at yourself if you have an interest therein. I simply study them 
to be able to answer people that bring them up. I do, I do not use their messages as something to say, okay, here's what I believe, and I believe because of this individual, Origen, or uh, Augustine, or Augustine, uh, or Ambrosia, some of those individuals that we will read about, possibly, and talk about. But I do, I do want to remind you that they're men, and they're uninspired men, and what they say has no more power unless it's in harmony with the will of God than anyone writing and speaking the truth today. The Word of God identifies that in, in the writing of the book of Acts where those at Berea were more noble than those at Thessalonica. And their nobility was because they, they listened to what was said and then they went and searched the Scripture to see if it was so. And so the Scripture is the foundation of our biblical endeavors, our spiritual endeavors, our eternal endeavors. They're not based upon what the church fathers or what I consider the early historians of church history. That's who they really are. They're not fathers in the spiritual sense and they should never be recognized as such and they should never be identified with this, um, this consideration and, and this title that the Lord suggested we should ever use to man. Call no man folly, speaking in a in a spiritual sense, because we understand that uh, he used it both in the physical sense, the secular sense of our moms and dads in that, in that relationship, but he also identified it in the relationship of uh, being those who were older guides, teachers, and, but they were never to be identified as a spiritual father. And that's the way men have actually identified them and I simply use them to appeal to you to identi in identification like that we would also use the word Saturday, though the word Saturday comes from the individuals who believed in worshiping Saturn. We don't, we don't use the word Saturday except to appeal and identify that particular day, the seventh day of the week. We do not uh, appeal to Monday as those who gave it its name in the worship of the moon. We don't, we don't understand that, and do not recognize that. We use it simply as identification. And so that's the way that I use the word church fathers in the sense that they are the early historians of the history of the church. Getting back to looking at where we left off last night, to talk about free will, we, we were able to undergird some points, but I want to make it a little stronger in a continuation of this study and, and think about it, and then, Lord willing, we'll get back to some of our words tomorrow and identify some of those things likewise. Joshua said, Now therefore, Joshua 24, 14, 15, Fear the Lord, serving in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood. If man doesn't have a free will, he cannot do what Joshua has just commanded by inspiration. You cannot put away something if you're already pre-programmed to do something else. It is impossible. We can see that free will is taught. He continues to teach free will, he says, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, if it is your choice and consideration that you're not going to do what I've just taught you to do and what is best for you to do, then here's something you must do. I mean, you've got to choose your own. You've got to make your own choice. Then choose you this day whom you will serve. That is the doctrine of man having free will. Jeremiah 6, 16, Jeremiah said, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and you shall find rest for your souls. Now we can see that this is the Lord directing Jeremiah through his inspiration to tell them, here is the choice, here is the right choice. Here is the winning choice. Here's the choice of pleasing me. 
and making it well with your soul. But he said, they said, we will not walk therein. Now they could not have said that unless they had free choice. And the Lord would not have asked of them to do something that if they were incapable of doing it. And so that, that script in the Old Testament there is teaching the free choice that God has given unto man. Ezekiel chapter 20, as we move on towards some of the teachings in the New Testament. Ezekiel chapter 20, 18 through 21. I said unto their children in the wilderness, Walk ye not in the statutes of your fathers. Now what did their fathers have? Free will. And what was their father's choice? An opposition to God. A displeasing to the Almighty. And here is what he's teaching them. Don't do like your fathers. If he is teaching them not to do like their fathers, that means they had a choice to make. It means that they had to choose. Like that Joshua said, Ezekiel is telling the people of God, don't walk like some of your fathers walk, but walk in my statutes. God's saying, keep my commandments, listen to my judgments, and do them. Hallow my Sabbath, and they should be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I'm the Lord your God. Notwithstanding, the children rebelled against me, and they walked not in my statutes, neither kept my judgments to do them, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. They polluted my Sabbaths. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the wilderness. And God is showing us there isn't any doubt about the fact that from his first statement all the way through all of his statements, God identifies that it was the people that turned against him by their own choosing and not his choosing. It was not God's will. We find that in the New Testament when we are told by inspiration that God was not willing that any should perish. That is free will. Genesis 18 and 19, God speaks of Abraham. I know him, he says, that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. When we begin in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve and throughout all of the Bible, including the New Testament, God's blessings are promised to those that will accept and will obey and will choose the right way. A highway should be there and a way. It should be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It should be for fools, a wayfaring men shall not err therein. God pre preached and taught and shared a message that man had a free will, but that man had to choose that right and distinct way that leads home. Many examples abound in God's word where men have rejected the Savior, but also many examples also are found where many received him. He came to his own. His own received him not, but to as many as received him, to them gave him power to become the sons of God. We can see free will. And you and I, we're going to have to make the right choice, brothers and sisters. We're not going to slip up and be rebellious against God and then show up one day as those that are the faithful of the Lord. Is it not also Jesus that teaches us free will in Matthew 23, 37, when he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets, and you stone them which are sent unto you. How often I would have gathered you together as a chicken gathers her chicks under her wings. But he said, you would not. Now notice that. They had the choice. 
They would have been gathered. He wanted to gather them. It was his mindset. It was his desire. It was his intent. But they chose otherwise. He came to his own and they received him not. With outstretched hand, many turned and walked with him no more. For 30 pieces of silver, Judas sold him to his enemies. In Luke chapter 7 and verse 30, the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected. It was not God in them and working through them that brought on this rejection. But this was their own decision, their own choosing, their own doing. Yes, the lawyers, the Pharisees rejected the <clears throat> counsel of God against themselves when they chose not to be baptized of the baptism that was offered in their day. Uh, looking back in Isaiah's mention of this, like those Pharisees and the lawyers as rebellious children, Isaiah prophesied, Woe, this is chapter 31 and 2, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel but not of me, and that cover with a covering but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. They made choices, and he identified two choices. They were trying to cover their spiritual nakedness, but not with the Lord's covering. Not with a message of truth. And the Lord identified in the book of Revelation when he was speaking to the seven churches and congregations as it is styled and spoken of in Asia of how the Lord spoke to those different congregations and particularly to Laodicea. He said, I've got some clothes you need to buy and you need to put those clothes on and you need to cover the shame of your nakedness. But they wouldn't do that, you see. But the Lord showed them they needed that. Well, here in the Old Testament, a very similar practical message of illustrating the same point is shown. That they needed covering, but they didn't go to the Lord for covering. But what they did was to add sin to sin, leaven to leaven, until the whole lump came to be leavened. He said they walked to go down to Egypt and they have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. See that the Lord said, they've rejected me. They haven't asked me. It's not that he wouldn't come unto me, all ye that labor is the same message the Lord shared years later, which also in Jeremiah's writing, chapter three, turn on backsliding children of Israel for I'm married to thee. God spoke that unto them through Jeremiah. John 3, our Lord continues to talk about this message of choice, this message of free will, beginning with verse 15, the Lord said, whosoever believeth in him, there's no reason he should perish. He does not say he shall not perish. The Lord said there is no reason for him to perish. What does that mean? That means that man can make the right choice. That means that man has the capability of doing such and that God has provided that way that individuals would not perish. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but they should have everlasting life. Why? Because God loved the world. Because God gave his son, who is the way, the truth, and the life. That whosoever believeth the way, the truth, and the life should not perish, but have everlasting life. The de definition of the Lord Jesus Christ, or the only begotten son, is that. God gave the way, the truth, and the life. And by making the choice, because we do have the free will to do such, God's way provides the way to escape. The writer of the Hebrew asked a question that we should all consider very strongly. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began spoken to us by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those that heard him? Now notice that, how shall we escape if we neglect? We have the choice to neglect. 
or we have the choice to obey. Verse 17, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. But God sent his son into the world that the world through his son might be saved. That means, brothers and sisters, free will. You cannot find any other teaching coming out of that. I don't know how in the world that the religions of the world believe that they need to christen babies, pour on babies, <clears throat> baptize babies. When the Bible teaches free will. When the Bible teaches obedience. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he's not believed in the name or the authority of the only begotten Son of God. And here is the condemnation, verse 19. This is the condemnation that life is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Notice this. This is condemnation. That light is coming to the world. Well, light, that's the Lord Jesus Christ and his message of truth. And men love darkness. They do not love the message of truth. They do not love the message of light. They will not choose the right way because their deeds were evil. Now, what choice did they make? Well, it's very clear the choice they had made was a choice in opposition to that which was against the evil. In verse 20, For everyone that doeth evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought or they're brought to pass through the means are in God. Every single point made from verse 15 through verse 21 leads to the conclusion that there is a free will of man that has been given by God. Again, Ecclesiastes 12, we ended with this point last evening. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. We have a choice. We can choose. Now, in the writer of the book of John, chapter 1, looking back over into the first four Gospels, verse 11 and 12, we identify a point last evening and made reference to it. Again, and let me just read it at this time. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Now, if the Lord had chosen his own to be enemies of him, why would he have come to them? Why would he have wasted his time with them? Why would he have said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou the stone of the prophets killeth those who sent thee out, and I would have gathered you, but you would not. But they did have a free will. He came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He tells us that. He even, he even told those that came to him and wanting him to go over to the Samaritans and go over to the Gentiles. Oh, I'm just, I'm just sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so the Bible says here, he gave unto them that received him the power to become the sons of God. The power to receive him was given by God. The power to become the sons of God was given by God. But the choice to receive him came from man. That's free will. That is free will. In Acts chapter 10, the apostle Peter was sent to the first Gentiles. This is an example that we mentioned before. And it's good to just refresh our memory upon it because it certainly 
is applicable at this point. And it certainly teaches beyond a shadow of a doubt, free will. Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. No respecter of persons. It cannot be true, it cannot be said of God that there is no respecter of persons with God if God has made some folks for the purpose of being lost. God will be a respecter of persons. If it is not true that man has free will, then it cannot be said of God that there's no respect of persons with God. If men cannot choose to be servants of God until God chooses them to be servants and moves upon them to be a servant. You see, that choice would not be man's, that would be God's. And if God chooses never to move where he can choose man, it's still the choice of God. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible does not teach that. And here is where we can see that of a surety in Acts chapter 10 where Peter opens his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive God's no respect of person, but in every nation he that feareth God makes the choice to fear God. How can we make the choice to fear God? We have to hear the message of truth. And how can we hear the message of truth? There has to be a preacher. And how can there be a preacher? The preacher has to be sent. And what sends him? The word of God. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes that is baptized should be saved. Be ready to give an answer to every man. The reason the hope that there is within you with meekness and with fear. We all are called upon to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth, and to give an answer of every and to every man that would ask us there a reason of our hope. Romans chapter 2 and 11 said, there's no respect of persons with God. Free will is the only true doctrine that is in harmony with such an inspired statement as that. Does God want us to choose? If God wants us to choose, then our choices, good or bad, cannot be against his will. If God wants us to choose, then our choices, good or bad, we need to make the right choices. And when we make the choice, good or bad, God's going to let us live with it. And God's going to let us be rewarded by it. By it. This is a plain from the many, many examples of the people that God warned to flee the wrath to come. And some did. And some didn't. When Moses drew a line on the ground and asked the people to choose, why were they killed? They made the wrong choice. Why did they get that particular reward? Because that's the results of making that kind of choice. It's always been that way. God's not a respecter of persons. When those people rejected God and stayed with those who wanted to engage in idolatrous worship, idolatry is a sin against the Almighty. It is the replacing of the position of God with something that is inferior to God and has no right to God's position. And the reward of that is the re reward of rejection of the will of God. God gave them what they chose. And God was not a respecter of person. The ones that chose God and did what God wanted, they received that kind of reward and God's kind of honor and God's kind of retribution. When Rahab the harlot had people to choose to come into her house to be saved and there were those who did not come into the house 
And they were killed right along with those who had never heard they needed to go or could go into the house. Versus those that went into the house. And those that went into the house received the reward of obedience and deliverance. And those that did not go into the house, knowing they should go or not knowing they should go, both received the same kind of reward based upon their disobedience. And neither one of them did God respect more than the other. They were all given that choice to make and those that made the choice and obeyed what God commanded, they were blessed. Lot went to his house. There in his house, he was told by the angels, you're going to have to leave this place. You're going to have to get out of this city. And I don't want you to look back. God was not a respected person. When Lot went to his sons-in-laws and his daughters and very likely the children and said, God's going to destroy this. He's going to burn this well-watered plain up. He's going to destroy it. And they just laughed at him. But they had a choice to make. And their choice to, was to reject the word sent to them through their daddy. They rejected it. And they were very sorry that they rejected it. However many children they had, they killed those children. Their wives that they said they loved, they killed their wives because there was no respect of person for God. God said those in Sodom and Gomorrah in this area, when I send fire, they're going to die. They're going to be burned up. They had free will. As it was in the days of Noah to get into the ark, they had free will. That's the same way it is with us today. We have free will. We can live and act and think and talk and dress and worship any way we want to. But there's no respect to person. There's no respect to persons with God. Joshua urged the people to choose. Jonah urged the people to recognize that it wasn't long, that city of three days journey, and God was going to destroy it. And every one of those people, because they had free choice to choose, not because God made it, but because the word of God reached their ears and reached their mind and touched their hearts and humbled their bodies and there became humbleness of heart and bowing their knees and begging to the Almighty and their free will sustained their lives because their free will led them to change their rebellion into faithful obedience and submission. You can't teach anything else that comes out of that. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, as we look here hurriedly at some points, likewise, in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward not willing that any should perish. Well, I'm going to tell you something. You can't make that statement that's spiritually stated unless there is free will for men to choose the way that keeps them from perishing. You can't make that statement. It's impossible. It's kind of like some of those things that, you know, that sometimes people, they say, have cute little sayings and say, Hey, uh, did, you, did you have a good time over in such and such a city? Didn't go. Didn't go. Well, when did you get back or something like that? Well, you can't get back from a place you ain't been. Bad English. 
But it's a true fact. You can't come back from a place you haven't been. You can't teach something that you don't know. You can't make the right choice unless you are capable of it. And there's so many choices that the Bible teaches that we must make and we cannot make unless we have free will to make them. And that choice is available. God has to make that choice available. Although God is long-suffering, he's a God of justice. We are destined to meet judgment. A judgment are the conditions of our life. Genesis 4, as I close, I'm going to read here a few verses of Scripture, and, and I want to read some of the different translations here because this to me brings a great culmination to this point, and we're going to move on to other things. I think we spent enough time and I think you can see beyond a shadow of a doubt it's a foolish doctrine, it's a damnable doctrine that, that these people have gotten away with religiously and it's because their, their flock, their followers are, are, are just, uh, they are just followers and they are not studious. They're, they don't reason, they don't consider, they don't search the scripture. The scripture doesn't have the meaning to them in being their guide as it ought to be, and they follow men. And you know what the Lord says about following men? In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines or commandments of men. In Genesis 4, 6, and 7, the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wrath? Why are you mad? What Cain was mad about, and the reason he killed his brother, is because his brother did what God told him to do, and Cain chose not to. Now, now this to me is one of the greatest examples in the Bible, and it actually starts off and lays the foundation through the journey of the Bible that man has free will. And not only does man have free will, God will come back being merciful to man's rejection and bad choice in the beginning and give him another opportunity and another opportunity. That's when we talk about the mercy of God, the long suffering of God, the, 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 the God that's slow to anger and slow to wrath and continually allows his message to go forth upon dull ears and, and closed eyes. Cain, why are you upset? Now, why did God make that statement? I'll tell you why he made that statement. Because he came to Cain and to Abel and spoke to those boys and told them they needed to worship and told them they needed how to worship. And we know that because the Bible tells us in Hebrews 11 that by faith Abel offered up a more excellent sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, faith comes by hearing God's word. That's the only way that true Bible-saving faith is shared with any individual that will be saved. Bible-saving faith comes as a means and only such of hearing the teaching of God's word. The truth is the only thing that sets a man free. Now, God was not getting on to Cain because Cain was a person of total ignorance without any available knowledge that had been dispersed. That's not the reason that God was getting on to Cain. He was getting on to Cain because Cain evidently rebelliously did what he did or he just closed his ears and wasn't listening good. Sometimes we give people are a little bit of inattention and in that in, in that time of inattention we miss a very valuable part of a prescription or steps in which we should take. Doesn't seem like that's the way it is with Cain. Now the reason I say that because God knows Cain's thoughts. You see he, he's not questioning Cain that he might know a little more about Cain. He already knows everything about Cain that there is to know about Cain and more about Cain and Cain knows about Cain. 
That's not the reason God's questioning. Why are you wrong? You think God's saying, I don't know. I, I need to learn something, Cain. How about you teaching me something? That's not what he's talking about. God knows Cain knew what to do. Cain wanted to worship. God knew that. Abel wanted to worship. And God knew that. Cain worshiped. God knew that. Abel worshiped. And God knew that. God knew that Abel brought him a sacrifice. And that Abel wanted to bring him a sacrifice. But God also knew that Cain brought him a sacrifice. And wanted to bring him a sacrifice. And went to the right place both Abel and Cain. At the right time, both Abel and Cain. And they were the right people, both Abel and Cain. But they gave the wrong sacrifice. One of them did, and one of them didn't. And see, God is saying, Cain, why are you mad? Because you knew what to bring me. Because I told, I, I gave the message. You knew about worship and you knew what to worship and you knew when to worship and you knew why to worship and you knew how. And why is your countenance fallen? Verse 7 shows that very clearly. But he says, Cain, if thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And why was God asking Cain that? Had Cain seen a lot of worship services? I don't know if he'd ever seen another worship service. I don't know. This may have been the first one. Very likely it was. But why was God asking him, Cain, if you do well, shall you not be accepted? What did Cain have to go on? His brother's example, that's why. God said, Cain, you knew what to bring me, and you didn't bring it to me. And Abel knew what to bring me, and Abel brought it to me. And you know why Abel was accepted. And you know if you do the same thing, you'll be accepted. You know what, he's, you know what God is telling him? Free will. That's what he's teaching him. I don't mind the Catholics and the Orthodox and the Presbyterians and the many shoots out of that and close to that. Those individuals, Episcopalians, I don't know why they don't understand that. Church of Bay, I don't know why they understand, don't understand that. And all the later day denominations have picked up portions of that, you know, and, and call that their own. Let me continue to read this in some of the other translations. So you can see this. Free will is actually taught. Cain, if thou doest not well, sin lies at the door. You're going to have to make the right decision. Cain, if you don't make the right decision, sin is going to capture you and it's going to rule over your life. And unto thee shall be his desire. Listen to that. Cain, if you don't stop sin now, sin is going to seek to totally capture and control you. If you, unto, unto you shall be his desire, but you can rule over him. Free will. Free will. Let me read some of these other and I'll close. The Young's literal translation said, is there not, if thou doest well, acceptance? And if thou doest not well, at the opening a sin offering is crouching, and unto this desire, and thou rulest over it, Cain, you've got to make the choice. It's not going to be good for you, Cain, if you don't make the right choice. But Cain, you do have the ability to make the right choice. You do have free will to choose the right outcome. And I.V. says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. 
It desires to have you, but you must master it. That is the greatest teaching masterfully spoken by the God of heaven about you and I and all men everywhere having the right ability with our minds to make the right choice about living for God. Cain didn't have to depend on his mom and daddy. I read that to you last night. Ezekiel's right. He didn't have to depend on what somebody else wanted or something else wanted because he personally could do as Joshua said, choose you this day whom you are going to serve. I love what Joshua went on, and I did not mention that last evening. I love what Joshua went on to say as he was leaving this world, understanding his days were numbered. God had warned him of the impending death that he was soon to find himself encompassed with. God said, telling him there of what was going to happen, and seriously recognizing it to be true, Joshua went to his people, told him to make the choice. But he said, I want you to know this. You write this down. I want you to remember this. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You know why? He had the ability to choose, and they'd already made that decision. God was not forcing him. God does not use a lasso a branding iron, an electric stick, or prod. Oh, no, no. We must choose. Come unto me is our choice. I stand the door and knock. That's our choice, you see. The Lord doesn't bust in on anyone. He's not a thief. He doesn't break down the He doesn't steal the souls that rightfully belong to the devil. Well, that's our study. Thank you for being patient with me. We offer an invitation at this set time. If you're not a Christian, we'd love for you to come and be one. Be very familiar to you. Come. Make your life right, won't you? Together. As we sing the selected hymn.